Good morning, everybody. As part of our webinar series for Construction Safety Week, um, this particular session is dealing with silica dust as an occupational hazard. Okay. So, um, silica dust has been identified as one of the eight occupational uh, hazards um, which may result in death or illness or disease or illness um, in the workplace. And that's why we need to put procedures and risk assessments in place to protect workers from um, the impacts of, of silica dust. So I suppose we can start off by saying, what is silica dust? Where does it come from? It's a naturally occurring substance found in um, most aggregates, rock, sand and clay, principally sand based aggregates. Um, in our, I suppose in our construction materials, it's commonly found in, uh, and there's high percentages of silica found in concrete and uh, concrete derivatives uh, like brick, tile, uh, plasterboard um, products like that. Um, it's an inert, um, unless it's disturbed. Um, when it is disturbed, it can generate very fine sized particles, which um, can find their way into your lungs. So any action which involves cutting, uh, chipping, drilling, and grinding um, a construction material that contains silica has the potential to generate fine silica dust. Um, and that's what we're talking about here this morning. So how much silica is contained in some common construction materials? Um, I suppose the two uh, to focus in here are concrete and mortar and our derivatives and plastic components. Some of these products can contain anything from 70 to 90% silica. Um, so composite panels, for instance, are uh, a prime example of something that contains quite a lot of silica. Now, respirable particles are defined as something which are typically less than five microns in size. If you consider the full stop at the end of the sentence is 300 microns, um, that gives you an idea how, how small a particle size five microns is, okay? And a very small um, sand particle in the beach would be 50 to 70 microns. So that tells you you're talking about really, really small particles, really, really fine uh, dust. So when you're talking exposure limits, um, what's relevant? Um, the rule of thumb is if you can see it in the air, then if you can see the dust in the air, then um, you can expect that uh, it's at a level which is potentially harmful to people that are working in the area. So if over a typical day's work, an eight hour day, if uh, an operator inhales the amount of silica shown in the image, um, it's potentially uh, uh, damaging to their health. Okay, so that's a very small amount of, of material as you can see in the image, okay. So how are you affected? Breathing contaminated air is the most common way that silica gets into your body, into your lungs, and the silica dust typically deposits on the lungs and its toxicity makes it difficult to remove it. Um, our body doesn't have a natural defense system to remove it, and so it stays there and it causes inflammation and irritation. And the result of the inflammation or irritation can damage the DNA in, this, in, in, in the cells. So you can see the damage there is um, damage by silica is it's the medical term for it is silicosis and um, so you can see on the left um, a lung which has been exposed to silica for a long period of time and on the right the healthy lung so the, the difference is apparent there uh, purely by the color and the condition of it so how are you affected um, prolonged exposure can cause lung damage um, known as cili ciliocosis um, and in severe cases that can be fatal. It's irreversible and the treatments that are available at the moment are limited. And, and there are three different forms of it. There's uh, chronic, which is exposure to low levels of silica dust for a long time, for a long period of time. 
then there you have an accelerated ciliocosis, which results from exposure to high levels of, of uh, silica um, over a period from five to 10 years. And then you have acute ciliocosis, which is a rapid, um, aggressive form, but where people are uh, exposed to really high levels for a short period of time, typically from a couple of weeks up to a couple of years. And it's important to say that uh, workers exposed to cilia, silica dust are, have the potential to develop lung cancer as a result. Okay. What can you do to protect yourself and others? Um, I suppose the first port to call in all cases is your safe working plan and the risk assessment. Um, look at the task that you're going to do, the potential to generate dust, and what corrective measures can you um, put in place. If you're undertaking a task which is going to generate a lot of dust, the first thing to do is um, eliminate as many workers from that area as possible. Minimize the number of people exposed. That's number one, that goes without saying. Um, avoid blowing the dust um, around and putting it up into the atmosphere as much as you can, okay? Um, water sprays and dampening, um, uh, which will require a second operator generally, um, is very effective in keeping down the levels of dust. And um, you can wet the area before you cut or, or chip or work on it, or you can do it continuously while you're, while you're cutting. Um, you can put in an exhaust system to a lot of the equipment um, that you use today um, to uh, ensure you minimize the amount of dust that's getting into the atmosphere in the working area. Um, where you're talking about heavily trafficked sites, um, again, you're talking about dampening down the area um, is a good measure to keep the dust under control. Um, it's something I suppose that's only been looked at recently is how we collect dust and dispose of it afterwards. Um, it should really be done by a licensed waste contractor. Um, and again, use of a vacuum system rather than traditionally brushing it and, and raising dust is, is, is a better measure. Then you're down to PPE, uh, RPE, which is respiratory protective equipment. It's uh, selecting the correct type of RPE, um, eyewear, um, gloves, um, and protective clothing. Uh, all are really important um, to employ. We just some examples here of poor practices and good practices um, for potentially dusty applications. I suppose the one common to us is uh, chasing concrete walls for um, force fix electrical. That's something quite common in our, in our business. Um, on the right hand side, you can see somebody there chasing a, a solid block wall and he has a tool extraction he has a vacuum system built into his tool there, so he's, all his dust is taken away and he's, he's wearing the correct PPE. Uh, the operator on the left of that image, um, he's chasing concrete wall there um, without tool extraction or without the respiratory uh, protective equipment. So um, second example, somebody leveling a floor there, uh, scabbling a floor um, for tiling or whatever, um, the operator on the left hand side uh, isn't wearing PPE and has no extraction or dampening. Um, whereas the operator on the right hand side um, has his dust extraction built in, his vacuum is connected to his um, grinder and he has the correct PPE. Uh, some other examples, um, two people operating consoles on the right hand side, um, uh, the operator on the left doesn't have dust suppression either. Um, he's not wetting it and he's not extracting from it and he has uh, poor PPE there. Um, two operators on the right hand side um, cutting a curb there. They have water suppression and they're wearing the correct uh, RPE. Again, uh, alluded to in the previous slide where uh, gathering dust and disposing of it afterwards Try and avoid uh, using traditional brushing um, and try and use uh, a vacuum system if at all possible with the correct uh, RPE. 
So what can you do to protect yourself and others? Um, avoid touching your face when you're wearing protective gloves. Wash your face and hands after exposure and before eating or drinking. Uh, it's good practice to shower after work. Um, segregate your work clothes from your personal clothing. Um, and if possible, leave your work clothes, protective clothing um, at work um, and avoid taking it home. And obviously uh, implement a clean as you go policy as at all times. Just a, a word on PPE, the correct type of PPE to use. Um, PPE is, uh, it's a supplementary measure and it's probably the last measure to employ um, after you've tried to eliminate and control a hazard. So if you, if, when you're looking at PPE, um, particularly for silica dust applications, correct glasses uh, or face masks, uh, correct clothing. Um, your RPE is particularly important and you've essentially two choices here. You've got the FFP3, which is a disposable respirator, or you've got the P3 particulate filter fitted to a half or a full face mask you should be using either one of, of those um, if, you're, if you're carrying out a task which has potential to generate silica dust. Um, they should be CE marked. And like all PPE, it should be suitable for, it should be fit the employee, it should be the correct size for you. Um, all PPE should be properly checked for cracks or breaks or um, any kind of damage um, and filters um, on RPE should be regularly checked and changed as well. They have a defined life. Um, so just please keep, keep an eye on that. Um, if you have any other information, you can contact HR or HSQE um, or your direct supervisor. Thank you very much.